2018, a white man who had a history of posting anti-Semitic screeds shoots and kills 11 worshipers, condemning Jews for enabling immigrant invaders to enter the United States. 2019, another white man guns down shoppers at an El Paso Walmart, killing 23. That man was angry over, quote, the Hispanic invasion of Texas. He told police after the fact that his goal was to kill Mexicans. A week ago, Saturday, a white man kills 10 people at a grocery store that he chose because of its location in a black community there, posting online that the people there belong to a culture that wanted to, quote, ethnically replace my own people. Now this racist sickness at work in the white people of our nation is clearly nothing new. Racists have been terror terrorizing people of color since the first arrivals of Europeans to these shores. This public, overt, unapologetic racism isn't so much new as it is resurgent, mainstreamed now by one of our major political parties serving to endorse and amplify such action. Yet the experience of this kind of resurgence is new for so many of us, perhaps who had anticipated that the election of the first black president was leading us toward a promised land, not energizing a reaction against it. The great replacement theory echoed by the shooter in Buffalo last week is the theory that Democrats and other members of the so-called liberal elite are using immigrants to replace the native-born majority with a new foreign-born electorate. And with this theory, right-wing racists have found the latest way to capture members of the electorate who have been taught that while it might not be okay to don a Klan outfit or wear a swastika on their sleeve, it is acceptable to adopt the racist ideologies that undergird them. According to a recent New York Times investigation, there are more than 400 episodes of Tucker, Tucker Carlson's show on the Fox network where Carlson either amplifies or promotes this great replacement theory. Now, in this congregation, I'd wager, we all believe that this ideology is morally bankrupt. It is the opposite of God's vision of the beloved community whose boundaries are defined by Isaiah as right action toward God and neighbor and which the New Testament goes on to illustrate as the church crossing the boundaries of slave and free, male and female, Jew and Gentile, boundaries that seemed fixed at the time. But what do we do about it? Clearly, whatever we have been doing isn't working. While we have been preaching this vision of the beloved community, the Supreme Court has been taken by similar forces trying to reassert male power over, over women's choices about their own bodies. Voting rights have been stunted, and even such settled law as Brown versus Board of Education seems like it could be next on the chopping block. While we have been arguing for an inclusive vision, the chasm between rich and poor has grown larger. Refugees have been displaced by yet more wars. And while we have been articulating a city of justice and peace, our murder rate is off the charts. And we continue to languish in a local politics that seems to fluctuate between a lack of vision and old-fashioned corruption. Meanwhile, Jesus promises peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. These words were jarring to me this week. 
how are we supposed to not let our hearts be troubled and afraid when our nation always seems to be on the brink of some kind of war? How are we supposed to not let our hearts be troubled and afraid when an angry man can get his hands on the kind of firepower used in Buffalo legally and the Congress isn't going to do anything about it? How are we supposed to not let our hearts be troubled while we are staring the dire consequences of climate change in the face? We know our oceans are rising and climate changes will unleash a refugee crisis the likes of which have never been seen before. We know our city is losing a thousand homes a year to the blight of vacancy and the population that continues to depart with it. How are we not supposed to let our hearts be troubled? One strategy is just to look away. I know a lot of us have tried to do that these last several years. Turn off the news. Tune into less media, avoid the streets where the kids are cleaning the windshields, the homeless are collecting the coins, and some of that avoidance is probably good for the soul. It is good to be reminded that our hearts need to be fed with more than the bitter truth of the world as it is. We need music and food and friends and dreams. If you're not careful, the weight of the world can squeeze all of that goodness out. And yet there's a fine line, isn't there, between setting good boundaries to keep you healthy and numbing yourself to the pain of the world. And like any drug, at some point the effects wear off and you're left facing the same amount of pain that was there before you tried to block it out. Ignoring the pain of the world isn't really an option. The prophet Jeremiah warned people in power not to use words about peace when they had no intention of enacting the kind of justice that makes peace possible, treating the wounds of the people carelessly in the words of the prophet. The North American church has a long history of that kind of empty peace talk, what Dr. King called a negative peace, which is the absence of tension over and against a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. I don't want to add to the church's historic preference for a negative peace today by suggesting that Jesus' kind of peace is found by ignoring the pain of the world. The leaders that Jeremiah critiqued offered empty words of peace from their ivory couches, insulated from the pain of the world, where Jesus offers this kind of peace on his way, on his way to his own death. He offers peace not as a kind of escape from the painful realities of the world, but as an invitation that exists at every moment, in every time, to access a disposition toward wholeness for yourself and for all people. A presence that you can commit to whether the world meets you there or not. Sometimes I wonder if that disposition is easier to achieve when you know you're going to die. When death is so unavoidable that all of the strategies that you are accustomed to using to ward it off fade to the side and you have nothing left to look at except as your life as it actually is. When there's no more time to look forward, no ability to change what is past, when the externals of your life that we all spend so much time trying to change are the variables removed from the equation and the only thing you can claim is what is right before you right now. A heart open to receive the world as it is, or a heart closed which might not be all that different from death itself. Meditating on one's death is not a new thing. It's a long-standing practice. Gretchen Van Ut and I advocated this practice in the class we taught on life and death back in the spring. In meditating on your own death, you learn to focus on living your life. 
Jesus takes his disciples to that death place so they can meditate on the commandment that he has given to them to love one another just as he has loved them, to focus their lives on this one thing that offers purpose and solace and community and grace and meaning and hope, past, present, and future. If you keep this word, Jesus tells them, you will never find yourself alone. And while Jesus' focus on his small community of disciples might seem distant from the world's big problems, from the racism and hatred and injustice and war that is consuming so much of our present reality, I think Jesus sees the personal and the political as inextricable from each other. Ann Applebaum, Pulitzer Prize-winning historian, was recently on Ezra Klein's podcast reflecting on Hannah Arendt's 1951 classic, The Origins of Totalitarianism. Arendt argues that the seeds of totalitarianism are sown in the soil of radical loneliness. Individuals who are cut off from other people, whether through the fear-based actions of dictators or the voluntary cut off from institutions or groups or civic organizations or even amplified by modern forms of technology that encourage us to consume entertainment and news in isolation from neighbors and community, those places that help us make sense of the messages that the world gives to us. These are the people, she argues, most susceptible to propaganda of many kinds. It seems to me that if we want to interrupt the conditions that lead to their capture, we best figure out how to address the loneliness that makes it all possible. And that doesn't mean not protesting or not calling out racism or not marching for justice and peace. It doesn't mean softening our commitments to marginalized people or communities of many kinds. It doesn't mean centering the feelings of white men over and against those who are dying at their hands. Binary choices are almost always false choices. No, I wonder if it means that the loneliness that so many of us have experienced through these times, the isolation that some of us have felt through COVID, or the loneliness that some people of color in our congregation have felt as participants in a majority white congregation reckoning with a post-George Floyd murdered world, or the cut-offness that some of the young people have felt from older generations struggling to keep up with the pace of changing social norms. That loneliness could actually be our point of connection with others who are just as much in need of community as the rest of us. The peace that Jesus offers is a promise to meet you there in that loneliness. To meet you there in the emptiness. To meet you there in the uncertainty. To meet you in the pain, which is really the only thing in my experience that has any chance of dispelling the fear that so many are carrying. And it may be the most important alternative the church has to offer to the world. Those who love me will keep my word, Jesus says, and we, that is God, we will come to them and make our home with them. The word for home would actually be better translated abode because it is the same root as the word abide, which is found all throughout John's gospel, the promise of God's full abiding presence in every moment, a promise which means that you and I never have to worry about being alone. Never. Never. Which is the only way that I have a chance 
of committing to the inner disposition of peace that Jesus brings with him into the toughest places of pain and heartache and struggle and injustice in his living and in his dying. Whether I'm standing up against armed white supremacists at a march for justice or walking through the worst loss I've ever experienced in my life. Whether I'm facing a life-ending diagnosis or trying to get through to a family member who's addicted to the propaganda of hate in the media. Whether I'm struggling to raise my children in the right paths for righteousness sake or taking a step into the unknown of my own future, God is ever present, which means that I already have everything I need. Just a couple of days ago, I spoke to a member of our church who's facing a life-threatening illness and surgery. They've taken the steps they need to prepare, thinking about death, making sure their affairs are in order, praying, meditating, reflecting, retreating. Right now, this person told me, I'm simply learning how to be with this. I'm learning how to live with this. I don't in any way wish to diminish the gravity of what this person is actually experiencing. But the thought occurred to me that this really is the question for all of us. For right now and at every moment, for those who believe in God's love and justice and want to struggle for it, however imperfectly, however incompletely in their daily living, how are we going to be with this reality of death within us and all around us? This rise of white supremacy, of authoritarianism, of violence and injustice. How are we going to live with this? Resisting, yes, but in a way that offers the world an alternative. A sense of real community that is the real antidote to your fear and to mine. The beloved community that is possible for you and me and each other. That city of God that's described in the book of Revelation where love and grace and peace is possible today. The intersection between the personal and the political where God is always found. No, where God meets those who have decided that love is the only way. Fierce love. Committed to making room in the world for your full flourishing and for mine. Struggling for a positive peace and claiming it, living it at the same time.